Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located, and thanks so much for joining the Behavioral Health Integration Capacity Assessment Introductory Webinar. That is a mouthful, and we're just thrilled to have you here. We've been working very hard on this tool and really excited to have the opportunity to introduce it and hear your questions and comments. Um, so we're going to start with just a little bit of an introduction from uh, Gretchen Nye or Carrie Brannick from the MMCO. And we're, then we're going to go in a little bit of today's, the purpose of today's webinar. Um, we're going to introduce the tool. We're going to hear from Catherine Ryder, who actually has used the tool in her organization. And then we're going to work really hard to have enough time to have questions on the content structure or even feedback or w ideas about how we can continue to spread this and other ways we may make this a more useful resource. So the purpose of the Behavioral Health Integration assess Capacity Assessment is to launch a resource for behavioral health organizations seeking to integrate primary care services. And really, we think it can be even a little bit more broadly applied, can also be an organization for primary care organizations that are interested in integration as well. Um, we are thrilled that today we have Dr. Ben Miller and Mary Rainwater on the line who helped, they were faculty who really helped develop the tool. We have Catherine Ryder, who I think is wonderfully going to talk, us, talk to us about actually using the tool in her organization. And then my name is Christina Gunther Murphy. I'm a director here at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, and we also have Mara Laterman, who's a research associate at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, as well as Kimberly Smathers from the Lewin Group, and Carrie Brannick and Gretchen Nye from, the, from CMS. So really a great group of people, and then also a great group of people on the phone as well. And if you don't mind, so we know who's on the phone and where you're from, and others know that as well. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, there's a little chat box. And if you want to select to all participants and just let us know uh, who you are and where you're from, that will really make sure we are, are tailoring our comments as we go through, but also allow us and others on the phone to know who's there. So we'll take a minute for people to actually, in this right-hand corner, put in um, who they are and where they're from. And, and it's helpful, too, if there's a group to know that as well. So uh, give people a minute to do that. And, and while you're uh, putting that in, and thanks uh, Trina and James for getting us started, I want to just open up and see um, if Gretchen or Carrie want to start by just doing a brief introduction before we dive in. Christina, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, my name is Gretchen Nye, um, and I'm here with Carrie Brannick, and we're from the CMS Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office. Um, in case you're not familiar with us, we are the office at CMS that focuses entirely on individuals who are enrolled in both Medicare and Medicaid, and they're often called dual eligible. Um, one of the many goals here at Medicare and Medicaid Coordination Office is to increase the capacity of providers who serve Medicare and Medicaid enrollees. Um, they, as you know, they are disproportionately affected by behavioral health and substance use conditions. Um, we just wanted to say that we continue to work to make healthcare delivery simpler for Medicare and Medicaid enrollees and meaningful coordination between behavioral health and primary care services um, uh, we, is a, we hope that this tool will enable behavioral health providers to identify and strategize ways to integrate primary care services and individual organizations that best serve their clients. Um, and we just wanted to thank Lewin, IHI, as well as all the state, local, and federal viewers and testing testers who already have seen this tool in its many iterations many times. And uh, I just also wanted to say that we're always accepting feedback on this or any of the tools available at the Resources for Integrated Care website. Um, and I know that there's a slide at the end of the presentation that has our contact information on it, so feel free to reach out to anybody on there. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Gretchen. We really appreciate it. And we, uh, we're remiss in not thanking the wonderful group of people who really helped us put this all together. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Ben Miller, who's going to start us off with talking a little bit about behavioral health integration and, and start diving into the tool as well. Great. Thanks, Christina. And welcome, everybody. It's nice to see so many uh, friends and colleagues on the line here. And I already see some of the the, the snark emerging from some of my friends, so thank you all. Uh, this is bound to be a fun time. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Christina. 
So I don't need to tell any of you all on the call, especially some of our friends in the uh, federal government, as well as some of our friends on the ground actually doing this type of work, the challenges inherent in healthcare are secondary to fragmentation. You, you guys get this. So I'm going to speed through a lot of the stuff that you know pretty quickly so that we can get to the tool itself. I mean, we know how egregious the divide is between mental and physical, and we know that we're practically doing everything in our power these days to bring together the mental and the physical. And I think as many of us have, have said very openly, this is one of the most promising value-added propositions for achieving the triple aim that, that we know of. So there's a lot of reasons to be doing this. Um, today we're gonna to be focusing on the specialty mental health space and ways to bring primary care to that population. And as, again, you guys know this, individuals with mental health or substance use disorders are at greater risk for complex physical health problems and increased morbidity and mortality. Some of this is due secondary to medications. Uh, other reasons of this is we haven't done a great job talking about physical health stuff in the mental health space, just as we haven't done a great job talking about mental health stuff in the physical health space. So the duals or the many, many population, we, we know use a disproportionate amount of behavioral health services. And this is a problem because of that aforementioned difficulty navigating between primary care and behavioral health systems, often made more complicated because of the separate payment structures. So individuals with an SPMI diagnosis may feel more comfortable receiving their care in behavioral health setting, making it all the more important to talk about how primary care can be better integrated into community mental health centers. And so as we often say, and it's the bumper sticker that we have, you know, the more diagnoses a person has, the harder they have to work in health care, and that's just flat out wrong. Next slide, please. So before we talk about the three approaches, uh, let me remind us about this aspirational model. It's kind of like the, the beacon on the hill where we're all trying to get to in this perfect world. You know, we think of words like seamless, team, communication, shared care plan, and then tying it all together is this ability to share information. And so I want to start with, with reminding us of where ultimately we want to get to and how some of the challenges that we all face in trying to get here, we're gonna talk about a little bit today, but I do wanna point out that this is about giving the patient a whole person comprehensive healthcare in whatever setting that they may be presenting. Next slide, please. So consistent with other efforts to look at really a glide path towards integration, there, there's three main approaches that we're gonna to highlight today. And some of you that have followed along with the brilliant work that our friend Dr. C.J. Peak has done out of Minnesota around the ARC lexicon know that in 2011, we, we talked about these three approaches to, to integration. And I'm gonna use those today as kind of a starting point for this tool. Next slide, please. So let's begin with coordination of care, coordinate care. Okay, the goal here is that behavioral health providers really collaborate or consult with other providers to address the health needs of their population. Uh, if you think of standard care, where we have a community mental health center and then we have a primary care practice, the goal here is to enhance their ability to share information and to communicate. Now, we all know the challenges here. And the first bullet point that talks about um, privacy and sharing laws, uh, there was a webinar yesterday just on this. It's, it's a challenge for many of us, and it's something that we will have to address when we talk about coordinating care. But there is one thing that we can do that's often not done, which is around building formal relationships. You know, if you ask any given room, do you know who the primary care providers or the mental health providers are in your community within an X mile radius? Many times folks don't know. So there's, there's often some small steps that we can take just to get to know the individuals that are in our community that are working possibly with our patients that we may not know about. Um, building these informal networks that consist of primary care and specialty care providers really does enhance that patient experience when we, do, when we understand who are those other individuals out there in our neighborhood. And then this is a really important point, this last bullet point. It's not just about the provider community. Health is local. Health is about things that have nothing to do with us as providers or as a system. It has to do with things like our community, uh, our, our transportation, the YMCA. Who else can be involved in that overall delivery of health care? Very critical point. Next slide, please. So moving from coordination of care to, uh, to co-located care. Uh, co-location, uh, obviously you all can unpack that term and get what it means, but this is the goal here is that behavioral health organizations integrate care by being on the same site or campus with a primary care provider. Okay, so we are co-located. We are sharing space. 
Now, just because you share space, many of you know this, doesn't mean that you're integrated. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily collaborating. What it does mean is that the proximity allows for a higher likelihood that you can communicate or do something around that patient. So the bullet points here make a ton of sense considering the type of approach here, that you provide team-based care with referrals, referral being the key word. Oftentimes in co-located environments, it's still, it's different tax IDs, it's different payment systems, it's, it's different ways to deliver the type of care that it respectively we're delivering. So there may be a referral still introduced. That seamless word hasn't necessarily been introduced yet. Um, we want to have the, the client talk to other providers at the time of the visit, and warm handoffs can be possible in these scenarios. Okay, it, it doesn't mean that there's not problems here, but it does mean that at least the providers have more of that proximate access to individuals that might be able to help with the patient. And then, of course, the data sharing piece, uh, which could continue to be a problem, but is something that, you know, allows us to start to think through, well, when they're above us, when they're next door, when they're in the same space, does that change how we would communicate with them? Next slide, please. And so when we think about building capacity in-house and we think about creating our own integrated way of delivering care, this is essentially that aspirational piece, but also the third, the third step, the third piece here that I wanted to describe. So this is behavioral health organizations that are literally bringing primary care providers on site to work together in that space to address the comprehensive needs of individuals in their organization. Now, there's a multitude of things that go into looking at how to deliver primary care and community mental health. But similar to delivering mental health and primary care, we have to start by identifying a population, and we'll talk about this a little bit more with the tool. We have to be flexible with who we see and when we see them. We have to have that um, ability for almost like open access, except walk-ins, or have advanced appointments where we know when people are coming. And then we want to look at how could you maintain some type of integrated, rigorous rigor record-keeping system. Next slide, please. Okay, deep breath here. We're going to go into detail on the Behavioral Health Integration Capacity Assessment Tool. And so I'm very excited to talk a little bit about this with you today. Um, next slide, please. The objectives of this tool are really to start to look at how to assist behavioral health organizations, community mental health centers and the like in evaluating their ability to bring on primary care, to integrate primary care. And so once a, a practice, a, a clinic has completed this tool, we hope that they're able to really consider potential approaches to how integration can serve their population or to understand their infrastructure in a way that operationally they know what might need to be changed to accommodate a new model. We have to understand and, and assess the strengths and challenges in this different approach, and I, I can't underscore this enough. It's not simply pointing out what's not right. It's highlighting what might be really right that might be a strength that could be expounded on that might lead us to have more successful implementation of an integrated approach. And then finally, the objective is really to set and prioritize goals for the organization. It's not you just walk away saying, okay, well, that, this is a great idea, and I think I understand a little bit more about why. This is literally that you can set goals for yourself as to how to achieve that aspirational model of integrating care. Next slide, please. So the structure of the tool is as follows. Uh, it's essentially it parallels what we're doing today on the webinar. Uh, there's an introduction to, to integration, why this matters. Then there's five sections, and we're going to walk through each section today. And as you can see, these five sections, I, I, I do want to point out that um, this is a pretty comprehensive approach in understanding what a clinic can do, a practice can do, and starting to make its way towards being more integrated. And, and we want to provide some direction as to where the clinics can go based on the evidence, based on the data collected through the tool. Next slide, please. So, yeah, there we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, I'm sorry. There we go. Okay, so um, the tool is intended for behavioral health organizations, and it's usually going to be completed by staff members with, that have a, a range of expertise at different levels. And so there might be a person that knows a certain aspect of how to answer a question on financing. Or you might need to talk to you know, the medical director on something around the clinical process or the organizational structure. There's definitely going to be questions that really the frontline staff are going to want to weigh in on that's a little bit different than maybe what the administrator sees. 
And so, there, you know, this is going to be a team effort in its entirety. Um, we really do think that, however, you can see here the bullet points, that this probably could take somewhere between 90 minutes and a full day, depending on almost like the maturity or in-depth analysis of a particular organization. Uh, many times practices have to have conversations, and you'll be surprised how, how, how often it occurs where different um, leaders or clinicians or, or different folks representing certain aspects of the clinic get in the room and they, they do not see the same issue the same way. And so this tool is actually going to be really important to help bring people to that place where they say, okay, here is what we're trying to get to. Here's what I think. Here's what you think. And that, that actually would be a, uh, probably a nice little intervention for practices that aren't on the same page. Next slide, please. So the evaluation framework, this is a really interesting slide, and, I, and I'm not going to walk through this in its entirety, but you can see here for each element, respondents will be asked whether their organization has a certain process in place. If the answer to that is yes, then they'll be asked whether the existing process is reliable. And you may say, well, what does reliable mean? Well, it means that you routinely do this, and, and you'll understand that when you look at the tool. Um, re respondents will also be asked whether there's a reliable process is possible given the organization's existing resources. So if there's not some type of process there that, that really can, used and be, can be used in a reliable fashion, then they'll be asked whether developing that process would have a higher or lower impact on the population served. So for both options, though, individuals completing the tool will have to assess whether it is possible to really consider, you know, where, where does this lead them? You know, do we have existing resources? Do we need to create resources? And so you can see here on the bottom, um, each element in the tool will fall into an assessment category of green, yellow, orange, or red based on the responses of the individual. And we're going to go into a ton of detail on how to use the scoring tool at the end of the webinar. So let me start with part one, understanding your population. Uh, many of you on this call know that one of the first things that anyone has to do before they develop a new program, a new intervention, is really understand who are you trying to serve with that intervention. And this is no different. Integration is no different. How can we help organizations consider how individuals' characteristics and needs affect that approach? Is it a one-size-fit-all? No. We're going to have to design the model based on the needs of the population. Um, organizations are probably not going to be able to, uh, to answer all these questions just due to some of the limitations of their data that they may collect. And so, as you can see on the third bullet point here, organizations that already have analyzed their data or selected an approach really don't need to complete this section. If you can just say, here's who we serve, here's the percent of individuals with diabetes, with hypertension, with fill in the blank, um, you're probably already in a pretty nice place from understanding your population with data. So you can look at data being collected through a variety of resources and sources, excuse me, um, electronic health records if you have a relatively mature system. Uh, or you can look at claims data if you have a partnership with some of your payers in your community. Conversations with individuals and providers, getting them to complete Excel spreadsheets if that's what you need to do so you understand better about the population. Um, so part one is really for self-reflection and is not going to be included within the overall score here. And that's an important point. Uh, next slide, please. So some, an example within part one of key questions. These are just the examples. Uh, the total number of individuals seen in the past 12 months. Being able to calculate things like denominators and numerators are really important so you understand your overall reach of your approach. The total number of visits in the past 12 months. The most prevalent, let's just say top five in this case, mental health and substance use diagnoses for individuals. Or, importantly for integration, the most prevalent physical health diagnoses for all individuals. Uh, the percentage of your patients with multiple chronic conditions. How many of the individuals coming in have a chronic disease, have multiple chronic diseases, and can you answer the question if they do or don't, or are they getting better? Percentage of your population that does not have a primary care provider. That may seem like a very simple question, but as many of you know, it's not a question that we routinely ask. And so it could be something that we might want to think through and able to ascertain the impact of primary care as they do come on site. Next slide, please. Um, my final slide here is just an example. This is a, a sample of what the tool looks like. And uh, as you look at the tool, you'll see uh, how we've actually uh, outlined this within each of these the examples here today. But understanding your population. So there's a paragraph that explains what needs to be done. And then it asks you to describe. And it goes into great detail on that description. But it is a place to get practices at least having that discussion on who are we serving and what are we doing for them. So I will turn this now over to Mary. 
Uh, hello. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Ben. And I just want to also um, thank our colleagues at IHI. It's been great to develop this tool with them, and then also to thank the team at Lewin and CMS for enabling this really important work to go forward. So as Ben mentioned, I'm going to now walk us through um, the scoring sections of the tool. And it's a pretty comprehensive tool and a little bit dense, so, um, uh, but we'll walk through it. And so the part two begins the first part where we're actually scoring, you're scoring your uh, capacities and capabilities. And the first section is really assessing your infrastructure. So this section of the tool drills down into five core operational capabilities that an organization's going to need to develop um, as part of an integrated approach to care. Uh, you'll see from the tool itself, as Ben mentioned, that it will ask you to look at your existing capabilities in this area and then also identify whether or not there are changes that you need to make to increase your capacity or enhance your ability to do some of these functions. So the five core areas that we've selected that will really um, assess your infrastructure are listed here on the slide. Um, that we're looking at now. And these are all things that an organization is going to need to do regardless of the approach that you select to do. So whether you're doing coordinated, co-located, or a more fully integrated approach to care. Uh, next slide. So the first um, example of a set of uh, questions that you'll be asked to answer around infrastructure and capabilities is uh, noted on this slide here. And you'll notice that the first thing the tool does is describe for you or operationalize what it would look like if the organization has developed those core capabilities that we're suggesting you, you assess as part of this process. So for example, this section you'll be, will, you'll be asked about your capacity to collect data, exchange information, monitor population health. And again, regardless of which of the approaches you choose, you're going to need to be able to master these functions uh, if you're going to move towards a more integrated uh, care uh, for folks with uh, behavioral health needs. So this slide shows a few of the key questions that are included in this particular section of the tool. Next slide. So another core capability within this larger bucket of uh, assessing your agency's infrastructure and capacity to do uh, integration is the area of measuring the effectiveness of the treatment that's being provided. Obviously, that's um, very fundamental, but really important that organizations develop the capacity to do that. And again, this slide here shows us a few of the sample questions that you'll be asked to follow that decision tree on. So, you know, very basic things like, do you track medication use? Uh, what about lab work? But again, all things that are part of determining what your capacity and what your capability will be to do this work. Next slide, please. Uh, being able to effectively communicate with individuals in treatment and their family members or members of their natural support systems, whatever that might involve, is another core capability that this tool will assess. You know, in keeping with the goal, the triple aim to really um, enhance the patient experience, you're going to want to have your patients and their families very involved in meaningful ways around the treatment, engage them in developing options and goals, and then really also ensure that the, the team working on delivering care, uh, collaborating together, is respecting all the HIPAA and shared consent protocols. So this section of the tool is going to drill down a little bit into those practices that, that um, you'll need to have in place. Next slide. So we know pretty well that um, from research and studies that someone's health and especially good health outcomes involve a lot more than just the patient visiting the doctor or going to a mental health clinic or a primary care clinic. So if an organization wants to try to improve a, a, the health outcomes for any individual or really improve the, the health of its population, it's really going to have to look at the whole health of the population and of the, of the patients they're seeing. And that includes really working on this area of community wellness resources and linking and providing access to those services as well. So this um, part of the tool, as you can see here from some of the questions that are listed, is really going to look at your capacity to do those things. Next slide. 
So the final area within the part two of the tool that's looking at the infrastructure is sort of the culture needed to support integration within your organization. And this part of the tool is divided into two sections. The first is shown here on this slide, and that's the leadership culture. And then you'll see in the next slide the second um, part of culture, which is really provider and staff engagement issues. But when it comes to developing an integrated behavioral health program, leadership uh, support is probably one of the most important components that you're going to need to have in order to ensure success. You know, a lot of times you'll hear people who are um, now providing integrated care talk about how important it is to have a champion at the leadership level um, for this model. And it's really one of the ways that you can ensure that integration is really taking hold, not only at the clinical level, which is really obviously very important and key to its success, but also at the administrative level and then strategically sort of more broadly within um, the environment in which your organization exists. So leadership is a really important part of uh, developing a successful approach. And this uh, slide uh, highlights for you, and it's a yes-no uh, section of the tool, the kinds of key questions that you'll be asked to look at to uh, assess your capacity here. Next slide. And then lastly, the um, second portion of the culture of an organization is the commitment and engagement of staff to the principles of integrated care, their willingness to embrace the concepts of whole person care, how to work collaboratively together as a team, and then some of the other um, items that are listed out here. And again, this is a yes-no section of the tool, and this makes up that second half of looking at sort of the culture of your institution to uh, embrace uh, integrated approach to care. Next slide. So this is actually a snapshot or, uh, you know, this slide shows you what the actual tool looks like. And again, as you can see here, if you can see in the small print, you have the option of first uh, deciding whether or not you have uh, the process in place and then whether or not it's reliable or it's something that needs enhancing or ongoing improvement. And again, as Ben mentioned, Mara is going to walk us through the scoring so we can uh, move on to the next section. So part three of the tool is identifying the population and matching care. And this section is a series of questions that assesses your organization's ability to identify the population you're trying to serve and then your ability to match the individual's needs to the appropriate care. Next slide. So there are three areas that we've um, set up to assess as part of the tool, and they're listed here on this slide for you. The first is the use of a universal screening tool, something that's um, very important. And then the second uh, bullet here is, the second point is how um, the organization uses staff or a group of staff uh, specific and specifically designates them to carry out a function or um, intervene on one of the needs that are identified in the tool, the screening tool that you use. And then the third piece looks at sort of the processes in place to match the identified need of the individual with the most appropriate care. So it's really about looking at can you as an organization use a tool, identify, you know, the different subpopulations within your patient population, what their needs are, and then in a really reliable way design treatment approaches and goals that will help uh, address the needs that you're identifying through your screening process. Uh, next slide. Part four then moves us on to helping you as an organization think about what the optimal integration approach might be for you. Um, and as Ben alluded to and spoke to, there really is no one size fits all. Organizations, you know, really do need to choose the approach that works best for their population, your organizational culture, and the distribution of resources within your local community. Um, and again, the, as we already mentioned, the tool is set up so that you can answer questions about all the various, the three approaches to integration, or you can just answer, if you're just inter interested in building your capability to do co-located, you can just answer segments of the tool that apply to that. Or if you're doing co-located now and you want to move to a more in-house uh, approach, you can use the tool to do that. So it's pretty flexible in that regard here. Next slide. So um, this is where it links back to those definitions that Ben walked us through earlier. So in this section of the tool, tool you're going to be asked about 
um, various aspects of the three approaches to integrated care. So the ones highlighted on this slide, these four bullet points, are those kind of um, key areas within coordinated care that you're going to want to assess as an organization. And again, it's going to link back to the goal and the discussion that um, Ben walked us through earlier in the tool, uh, or excuse me, earlier in the webinar that are really kind of core components of a coordinated care. And those are listed out here for you. Um, the next part of Section 4 is going to, again, link back to what it means to do co-located primary care services. So often in co-located primary care services, you're going to have navigators and care coordinators doing some, you know, hands-on linking of uh, patients to resources. So that's going to be one of the things that's going to be looked at in detail. Or also how you um, structure your program to access um, uh, primary care on site. Next slide. And then lastly, the tool is um, going to ask you a series of questions about what, it, what it's going to take to build primary care capacity in-house. And, and again, this slide includes some of those things. So obviously, in addition to doing the care coordination and the, and the um, accessing primary care that we talked about in the other two approaches, if you're bringing primary care capacity in house in this model, you typically are going to be doing much more robust primary care on site. So one of the things the tool is going to ask you about is do you actually have the space, the supplies, the materials, can you do lab work, can you collect blood work, things of that nature. Um, in this part of the tool, you assess your capability to do that. Next slide. And then finally, the last section of the tool is uh, um, on financing integration. And we added this because obviously for integration to really take hold in any kind of long-term way, um, financing has to be addressed. But we also discussed that this is probably one of the most challenging areas still for most organizations when it comes to developing um, an integrated approach to care. And it's really so dependent on how the local health care resources are organized. It's going to vary a lot from state to state and then even within local jurisdictions and in, in regions. Um, and hopefully um, also there's still a lot of change going on in this area and hopefully within you know, some of your communities there's some alternative payment methodologies evolving. But regardless, it's an important area for organizations entering this field to think about, and at least in the short term, it does still require quite a bit of create creativity and collaborative work and really a bit of hustle to fund integrated care, but um, we wanted to include it. Next slide. So while we wanted to include it, we didn't want it to be a barrier to organizations that were thinking about moving forward and developing an integrated uh, approach, but we definitely wanted to elevate its importance and get everybody to start thinking about it and planning for it. So what we did in this section of the tool, and you see um, some of them listed here, is just advance a series of questions for the organization to consider and start discussing. And as you can see, they're really designed to see how much you're doing now as an organization in terms of your own finances that, and, and um, functions, the ability to capture costs of what your um, the care you're providing and track them, particularly those that might be related to an integrated care approach. And then some questions as well around the landscape, the financial landscape in your particular community, how plugged in you might be to some of the alternative payment methodologies that might be rolling out in your community, and really get organizations to start think about building the business case for integrated care. So that's the final section of the tool. And I'm going to stop there and let Mara walk us through how to score the tool. Thanks, Mary. So we'd like to give you a brief demonstration of the online version of the tool, just to show you how it works in practice and talk a little bit about how the tool will be scored. So you should be seeing now the resources for Integrated Care website, which has apparently locked me out. So I will log in quickly just to give you a sense of what is in the tool. And the URL is actually... Um, at the end of the presentation, so then after this webinar, you can go on and check it out yourself. Sorry for just a slight delay. So on the website, we have both the downloadable paper version of the tool and the online version of the tool. And I'm going to show you the online version, but the downloadable version is also available if you'd like to complete it with pen and paper. 
So the introduction is in one section, and if you launch the actual tool, we'll go through just a few of the response categories to show you what they look like. So the first section that Ben talked about, understanding your population, there are spaces to input your most prevalent diagnoses, depression, anxiety, for example, and then as you scroll down, there are places to input your different responses. And then in the following section, each question will ask you, do you have a process in place? If you say yes, it will ask you if the process is reliable, so you could say yes, and you can make any notes that you want. If you say that you don't have a process in place, it will then prompt you to ask, would the development of this process have a higher impact? And if you say yes or no, it will also ask if it's possible to develop a reliable process with existing resources. So this is just kind of a flavor of what the whole tool is like, and I just want to show you on the culture section, Mary mentioned that we have a slightly different response category here. We have going from strongly agree to strongly disagree um, because the, the nature of the questions was slightly different. They're less process related and more whether or not you have different concepts in place. So if you go down to the bottom after you complete the tool, you'll be able to save a draft or submit it. And submitting it is just that you're, you're able to see it. You're not actually submitting it to any other organization because the tool is self-scored. But if you're logged into the Resources for Integrated Care website, you will be able to save your responses so you can come back to it later. You won't need to fill it all out at once. So just to note that if you're not logged in, you can explore the tool as much as you want, but you will not be able to save your responses. And so I'm just going to leave this tool and then talk a little bit more about the scoring. So this is just a sample of what the Excel spreadsheet would look like if you were using the paper version, just to give you a sense of how the process, reliable process impact and whether or not you can implement it using existing resources and notes. And to interpret your results, we have this little chart, which is to really guide the organization's priority setting process around these different concepts. So the results are categorized into four assessment categories. The green category means that the existing process is satisfactory and reliable. Yellow means that the existing process needs improvement, but it's not yet reliable. Orange means that no process exists and that creating one will have a higher impact on the population served. And red means that no process exists and that creating one will have a lesser impact on the population served. And so we want organizations to really focus on addressing elements that fall in the yellow and the orange categories. With green, you're good to go, and on the yellow and orange, you're able to work on things that you have a higher likelihood of being able to implement more easily that have either a higher impact or that you're able to implement using existing resources. So we had a number of people test and review the tool, and we're so grateful that people took the time to go through this and help us refine it. And this is just a list of some of the organizations that helped us test it. And you can see um, that we had feedback from state government, from federal agencies, key organizations such as CHCS, as well as many behavioral health organizations. And some of the feedback that we received from these testers, every organization and expert we spoke with really felt like the BHICA was useful to providers working on integration, and they noted that seeing where they're doing well and where they can improve was very helpful. We also received feedback that the tool is very comprehensive, but it is rather long. You might be thinking that as we've gone through all the different sections and as I was scrolling through the tool, that it is quite long. However, it is comprehensive. And to address the length, organizations who already have a sense of either which approach they want to implement, if an organization knows that they want to work on co-location, they don't necessarily have to complete the coordinate care or the build primary care services in-house sections if they choose not to. It's really up to them to fill out whichever capacities they want to work on. And then finally, the testers noted that substance abuse providers may also be interested in this tool. And so to make the tool more inclusive of the substance abuse community, we adapted the tool so that it also applies to substance abuse providers. So now I'd like to introduce Catherine Ryder. And Catherine is the Executive Director of Tri-County Mental Health Services, which is a behavioral health uh, organization in Maine. They've been working on integrated primary care for a little while now. And Catherine was one of the early testers of the tool, and she's agreed to spend a few minutes today talking about her experience using the assessment, how it can inform behavioral health organizations' efforts to integrate primary care. And we're just so grateful that Catherine has uh, agreed to join us today. And just a note that we will have time at the end of the webinar for all questions, including questions for Catherine. 
So, Catherine, I will unmute you and turn it over to you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, so I would like to just start by saying that we had about 10 years of experience in integrating behavioral health services into primary care when we began our planning for our behavioral health home. And at the time of being asked to um, pilot the tool, we were probably only within the first six months of our work plan development for the behavioral health home. So it was fairly early on, but that said, um, when, <laughs> when we completed the tool, I have to tell you my initial response was that it, it took the wind out of my sails in thinking, oh gosh, we still have so much more work to do. But the good news about that is we reframed it because as Ben said early on, this is kind of an aspirational thing. Where can we go from here? And so we began to look at this as a way to kind of develop some PQI for the agency plan. And so we really took a deep dive and looked at where our strengths and challenges were as we began to reshape the work plan. And the good news is that um, we understood we had some time to finish incorporating many of the elements that were still kind of outliers for us. And there were many lessons we learned along the way, including that as we were considering the embedding of primary care, we really didn't understand exactly what that would mean in terms of setting up exam rooms and patient flow. It was very different than what we had anticipated. So we understood we were going to have to be flexible with ourselves in terms of some of the, the goals and the dates that we had set for the work ahead of us. We also took a look at our resource capacity as we were looking at the different elements in the assessment and saying, do we have what we need? And if we don't, can we get it? And where would we find it? Probably really key to all of that was having um, leadership at, at every level of the partner agencies representing the work that we were doing and having a champion within each of those partner agencies as well. So we looked at who the, the individuals sitting at our steering committee table were and identified that we had some missing community partners, um, identified who they were and invited them to start participating with us in monthly steering committee meetings. We identified what capacity our electronic health record had or did not have and how would we build that in. And then we looked at staff and when we determined that there were areas where we had a dearth of resources, looked at how we might fill that void, began to partner with our, our local um, colleges and university to have students on board um, as well as uh, some local volunteers. So we really established what I believe is a fairly multidisciplinary team which has consumer voice present at all of our meetings informing our decisions. We have a consumer advisory team that vets documents that we use, especially in terms of assessing um, consumer satisfaction as a participant within the behavioral health home. And then also, uh, fairly importantly, as we're looking at all of this and thinking about the administrative overhead that comes with this and therefore the associated expense, we built a project cost model that really will allow us to assess ongoing how are we doing in terms of maintaining, um, not just clinically, but fiscally. So bottom line for us is while it is clearly challenging and there's still much more for us to do, it's been really informative having this tool and our quality management department is kind of driving our ongoing review of that. So we're pretty excited about the potential and really excited about the model of the behavioral health home itself. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Really, really appreciate it. It's so helpful to have that perspective. Um, so we will stop talking in just a few minutes so you can start writing down your questions. But um, we just wanted to let you know that there are, other, there are a number of other resources that are available. And I wonder, Kimberly, if you want to touch a little bit on the, uh, some of the other resources that are available. Kimberly, are you there? I'm here, I apologize, I was talking on mute. <laughs> um, absolutely, so um, on the resources for integrated care website, we have some existing tools, um, you know, as well as some tools that we'll be developing and putting up there shortly. Um, there are tools related to, um, you know, multiple stakeholders, um, you know, for providers, obviously, there are tools related to target populations, whether you're serving individuals with serious mental illness, physical disabilities, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I mention those as I know these populations sometimes will, you know, overlap across providers. And in terms of topics, um, you know, we've been focusing a great deal, particularly for those with serious mental illness, on the topic of self-management support 
and around navigation services. And we have um, an organization assessment tool for the self-management support work as well that's targeted for providers serving those with a serious mental illness. And we'll be developing a similar guide um, related to navigation services for those with serious mental illness. So that's a brief overview. Happy to answer other questions if folks have questions related to other tools. Thank you so much. So um, we have questions for you, but certainly we want to make sure that we address your questions first. Some of the things that are on our mind are around, are there additional or companion resources that might be useful, other things that we could help develop in addition to this? Um, how might we make this tool widely accessible or reach a wider audience if you feel like it's a useful tool? And then um, what specifically other audiences might find this, this useful, and, and I'll also put out there, are there other calls that you think would be helpful, other, um, you know, closing the gap type calls that we could do as people begin to do this? And I imagine that you'll probably want to be looking at the tool. We've been talking about it very hypothetically, but as Gretchen said, we really are eager to hear your feedback. So um, there was one question that I'll throw out there that was earlier in the chat. It was in the midst of just seeing all the wonderful people we have on this call, but I'll start there and then hope that others will use the chat, <clears throat> excuse me, to include their questions. And I will just note, please make sure that your chat goes to all participants so that the panelists can see it as well. Um, and you're also welcome to use the little hand icon to raise your hand if you wanna if you wanna ask a question. Just note if you have a if you have a little phone to the left of your name, um, then we can unmute you. If you're listening through your computer speakers, that may not be possible. So I'll start with this question and then um, I'll, I'll look for others as you begin to type them in. But Mindy asked, is the tool intended for use only by those behavioral health organizations considering bringing in primary care for the first time, or is it intended also for agencies that are already doing this work? And I can start, and then I'll have my colleagues jump in as well. So I think our idea was to make it both for people who were beginning to consider the best approach, but also for those who already had decided that this was a priority. So we're really looking for both types of organizations. Now, how you use the tool might be a little different depending where you are in your journey. If you say we're pretty far along, but we just want to see if there's some new ideas we can make sure that our approach considers, then you could do really look at the tool for, okay, what are the existing gaps? If you're brand new to it, you might want to just start with one section and work through one section and really think about what, where might we start? What, how would this work? And as Ben said, really looking at your exist, leveraging existing strengths. So often we think about the deficits, but really thinking about what are the strengths that we can build on that will help us do this work? And as you see your greens pop up, hopefully it will remind you that there is an opportunity. Are there others want to jump in? I would just add really briefly, I think that was nicely stated, this has been that this is a very, very thorough tool. Uh, we really didn't leave anything out here. And so I think Catherine said it just magnificently where that in the process of going through the tool herself, even in the midst of many years of working towards that, there were still things that she found that um, might be an area that they can improve on or something they may not have thought about. And I, I would just encourage those of you that even have gone through the process of integrating, there might be something there that you just didn't see that might help mature your effort, even if you are one of the exemplars already in this space. Yeah, I agree. I, this is Mary, and I think, um, as Catherine said, it was really a, an important exercise to, that helped build the cohesiveness for her program, even though they helped identify a lot of things they still couldn't do. It did, you know, it was a really important process to go through, so. Great, and both Rick and Samantha have the same question, which is, is the tool valid and reliable for primary care organizations seeking to integrate behavioral health? Ben, do you want to start with us? Sure, great question, guys. Um, so obviously there's going to be some distinct characteristics associated with the context. And I think those of you that have lived in the primary care space as, as much as I have, you understand that there's unique attributes to bringing on mental health, just as there's unique attributes of taking primary care to community mental health. First of all, as similar to how we laid this out in the tool, there's a different population. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, based on the different population, what are the needs that we're going to be needing to create for the model? Um, but I think that if you really look at kind of the underlying characteristics of what makes good care, and I'll keep it very general here, it's some of the same things. Uh, it's good team-based communication. 
It's the ability to have an operationalized workflow so that you know when there's a patient that's going to benefit from whatever service that they can then be engaged. There's the ability to share information. There's the shared treatment plan. All of those things, if we just totally were agnostic to setting, we would still want those to be present. And I think you see a lot of that stuff here. Uh, I really do believe it. While some of the questions are going to be unique based on the context, I, I don't. I don't think that it's impossible or outside the scope of reality to change some of that and look at it in a different context. It's just for the purpose of this tool, um, we really did focus in on that community mental health, more specialty mental health type of of environment. Great. Um, Esther wrote, uh, she was wondering if there's a companion assessment tool to assess localized billing systems or financing systems outside of the organization, and these systems can often impact the sustainability of integration efforts. Uh, so this is Mary uh, Rainwater. Um, I'm not sure uh, specifically on that, but I know that um, there's been a couple web webinars led by Del Jarvis who's an independent consultant but does a lot of work for the National Council on Community Behavioral Health. And he's done several, particularly around how to look at your financial environment, both internally within your own organization and how to identify what some of the costs are that you should be tracking relative to uh, providing integrated care. And then also what your construct is within the community in which you're working, um, whether it's county financing or other sorts of uh, uh, funding streams. And he's done several that uh, I know, Esther, you're from California, that are specific to California. So um, that his, it's on his website, and I know it's on the National Council or the CIHS uh, Center for Integrated Healthcare Solutions websites as well. It's a good tool. So um, then just Christopher wrote, so the answer to the question of is this a viable tool for primary care integrating behavioral health, the answer is no, since it was not designed for that. At the same time, there are principles here that apply to integrating behavioral health into primary care that could apply to a tool that geared, that could apply to a tool geared to that purpose. Does that yes. sound right to you? D Dr. Hunter has a way of making me sound much smarter than I really am, so I thank you for that, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, and I will say, too, certainly if you're a primary care organization that's looking at full integration, for example, an FQHC that's planning to be on site somewhere else, this would be very, this would actually, you would be a prime target. So if you're just looking at the other direction, um, you may have to do a little translation, but it could still be relevant. But if you are actually thinking of working very closely with the behavioral health organization, we think you're a, you're a primary target for this. Uh, and Bill Gardham just noted that there, the most critical area for most of us is these financials, financials and the money needs to follow the person and not be an obstacle to accessing care. So, yep, that's a really important point. Um, we just have a few minutes left, so I'm going to make sure we just cover the, where you can find these resources, but certainly if there's another question that comes in as we're doing that, we'll make sure we get one more answered. Um, the, uh, you can access the online tool or download a paper version at this URL link. We will be sending the slides out to participants ahead of time, so don't worry. You don't have to you know, quickly try to write this down. We'll be sending them in a PDF format so you have access to it. And, and I'll just reiterate, <laughs> reiterate what Gretchen said, is that we really do want your ideas, your feedback. Are there other webinars? Are there other tools? Are there other things that might be useful? So please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Laura or Gretchen. We really are here to make sure that we are providing helpful and useful tools. Um, I will just ask if Gretchen or Carrie wants to make any closing comments before we close up the webinar. No, we just wanted to thank everybody for joining the webinar, and uh, hopefully you found it useful. Great. And Kimberly? Uh, nothing for me. Thanks for joining. Great. Um, and so there's another piece on the financing, which we can see there's a lot of energy around that. Um, so we'll make sure that we take some of this feedback, look at what's existing, maybe even see if we can better compile some of the resources that are available. So um, thank you. Huge thanks to Katherine Ryder for joining as she's trying to do this work day in, day out, and joining to talk about her experience, our colleagues at both Lewin and MMCO. Um, 
thanks so much for, for being able to be on the line. And also just thanks to Ben and Mary who have been really helpful in both helping to develop this tool but also speaking to it. Um, and we will see that there are some other questions that come in. We'll try to make sure that we get answers to that when we send around the slides, just a quick Q&A so you have that as well, um, since I know some people have to run. So thank you again. Thank you for joining, and we look forward to hearing from you.